every day I wake up and I'm like, nobody cares because there's always going to be someone else that's going to come up and be a better writer or have more book releases or suddenly just blow up on book talk or whatever. Like nobody cares. And so you have to look at it as a marathon, not a sprint. And I literally, every time I do a keynote, every time I talk to people, I'm like, you have to remember that you are going to have times where maybe you've written the best book of your entire life but no one's gonna buy it. Yeah. Maybe grandma yeah. buys it, right? Yeah. Or like your mom or dad buy it. And it, and it's really depressing. And I think that you have to believe in yourself as much as others believe in you. And I know we talked about that, I wanna say yesterday or earlier in the in our group chat, but if you're not willing to even purchase your own book, if you're not willing to even believe in yourself, then why mm-hmm. would you ever expect anyone else to believe in you? Welcome to the Inkit Podcast. Today, I'm interviewing Rachel Van Dyken, one of the superstar authors of our generation. Starting in 2011, She has published 140 books, 20 times on the USA bestseller list, multiple times on the New York Times, 75 audiobooks, one movie, and a few more in the making. She is also part of the select group of authors published on Galatea. Over the course of the last decade, she has sold more than 10 million copies. I'm Ali Albazas, founder and CEO of Inkit, and today we are going to explore the secrets of Rachel's success. So let's go down the the memory lane. Uh, (laughs) In uh, 2011, that was uh, when you wrote your first book. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell us a little bit about that. Like, how how did everything uh, get started? So at the time, I was a school counselor, and I also worked for the state of Idaho as a um, kind of like a social worker, basically. I worked with kids. So I would go to work at like 6 in the morning, counsel all these kids, and then work for the Mm -hmm. state until like 8 o'clock at night. Um, and then do it all over again. Um, I also taught Spanish and I um, taught uh, drama. I don't even know, like I did so many things. I did choir, like I just had, it's like when you work for like a private school, they just kind of throw you out there and say, do all these things and you know, make it work. So for me, I was so stressed out and had so much anxiety that I started writing in between seeing my clients because I wanted to make sure that like I was taking care of myself too. And I would take my clients that had like basically no social skills, I would take them to the library and it was extremely poor at the time, not getting paid like anything to do the multiple jobs I was doing. And so I would take them to the library and that's how I would uh, kind of have my escape. I would I would read books and I would literally check out like 15 books. So Julia Quinn, Eloisa James, like those were my jams. And for whatever reason, I told myself in my head, maybe I was just delirious. I was like, I could totally write a book. So I would sit and just write chapters. And so I started off actually in Regency Romance. And so I started writing historical romance first. Um, was horrible at it, by the way. Um, but I somehow got a publisher that was an indie publisher at the time because back then there was this huge boom, as you know, with indie publishing. And they they signed me on right away. And my second book hit USA Today. So I mean, and I always wow. tell people like this isn't that's not normal. So you can't yes. don't like lower your expectations a little bit. Um, but yeah, and then my job at the time, I had quit and started another job after I got my master's in business, and I ended up having the worst job ever and having to like fire people that were like, you know, decades older than me, and I just hated it. And I was working probably sixty to eighty hour work weeks, and I told my husband like, I'm like, I just want to quit. Wow. I'm so done. And um, ended up that was after the the first two books. Yeah, after the first two books, and uh-huh. so I ended up quitting my full time job and just kind of jumping like on a leap of faith and being like, okay, God, what, like this is what's happening right now. And my oh husband my was so great about it. And it was weirdly after he he was staying home at the time because he used to be a commercial diver, and he actually three months after we got married almost died. Um, so because he got crushed by a spreader bar, like a six thousand pound spreader bar, like. 300 feet down because he was a saturation diver so anyway so that whole that whole like scenario just you know for him to like have that faith in me and say like okay Rachel you can quit and we'll just figure it out and see what we're going to do was really powerful and impactful for my career wow wow and then how, how, how did that go from, from, from then onwards? So the, the first book in 2011 was published by a publisher, mm-hmm. uh, second one as well. Yep. And then, and then how, how did it go from, from then onwards? Like how did you? So what I actually did is my, so after I started, I stopped doing Regency Romance, I really wanted to write New Adult. I felt like that was like the, the niche, like everyone was doing that at that time. That's when mm-hmm. Jessica Sorensen, Rebecca Donovan, like these authors were coming out, Monica Murphy, doing you know crazy amazing new adult stories and college stories and I really really liked that and I liked reading it and I always say like I'm a reader first I'm a writer second right so I was like I I could totally write a story like this and so the publisher that I was with at the time was a sweet they call them a sweet publisher so Mm -hmm. you can't cuss you can't have sex scenes you can't do anything in it 
And this book had a lot of that stuff in it because it was a new adult at the time, right? It's very coming of age, like someone experiencing like life for the first time. And that was the book, The Bet. And every publisher turned me down, like big five, big six at the time, every agent turned me down. I didn't have an agent at the time. And so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to self-publish this and see what happens. And that's the one that hit number one on the New York Times within like a week. Wow. Yeah. That must have felt amazing. Yeah, I kind of wanted to email <laughs> all of them back and be like, listen, I was right. No, yeah, it felt really good. Like we, I sold a lot of books. And actually, that's how I got involved with like Apple and like different companies because they contacted me because they wanted that book on their store. And at that time... I want to say we sold over 150,000 copies in a couple weeks, and that was just on Amazon. That wasn't even on um, Kobo or or Apple or anything. So then later on, I put everything up there. Yeah, it was definitely a wild ride. That's so cool. That's that's amazing. From just listening to this, it sounds like uh, you just like wrote the book, uploaded it, put it on <laughs> Amazon, and then that was it. Or or how how, how did that go? Like how, how how what what led to that success? I, I quite honestly don't know. I think God's timing. I think also just timing in the industry at that time before mm -hmm. you know books were just people all of a sudden were like we're reading like there's tons of content out there and we were just new in the industry you know what I mean um, I also at the time didn't have like any money as I said and so my um, husband gave me he was like use $50 and then Aww. use another $50 after that and then just like let it kind of like roll down the hill for like an Amazon or a Facebook ad. So I don't think it was actually that that caused it to do well. I think it was good timing. I think it was a good just a good book quite honestly and I think sometimes we just hit it lucky. You know, as authors. Nice, very cool, very cool. So um a lot of authors um when they when they get started, they think um They will just like write a book, mm -hmm. um, upload it. It's gonna be uh, an overnight success, and they can uh, book their trip to Hawaii and <laughs> uh, and just like you know live there and retire. Um, but um, for you, it's been um, uh, you with your mindset. You have been, I feel, um, a lot of the the reason and the way you did things. You you were like really fighting for your success. It feels mm -hmm. like over the last. Uh, 12 years since since you you got started. So, um, what what do you think? Like, if you look at the last 12 years that you've been continuously successful and releasing and releasing and having like so many successful uh, releases, what's been the um, the mindset that that has led to to your success? I know a lot of authors are are looking up to you, so um, I would love to to hear from from yourself. No, that's a really great question. Um, I think consistency is the number one thing. Um, number two is no one cares about you. Like I always tell myself that, like no one cares. Like you can't have an ego, you can't have, oh, I've made it or I've done this or I've done that. Like again, every day I wake up and I'm like, nobody cares. Um, because there's always gonna be someone else that's gonna come up and be a better writer or be have more book releases or suddenly just blow up on book talk or whatever. Like nobody cares. And so you have to look at it as a marathon, not a sprint. And I literally, every time I do a keynote, every time I talk to people, I'm like, you have to remember that you are going to have times where maybe you've written the best book of your entire life, but no one's going to buy it. Yeah. Maybe grandma buys it, right? Yeah. Or like your mom <laughs> or dad buy it. Um, and, it. And it's really depressing. And I think that you have to believe in yourself as much as others believe in you. And I know we talked about that, I want to say yesterday or earlier in, the, in our group chat, but um, if you're not willing to even purchase your own book, if you're not willing to even believe in yourself, then why mm -hmm. would you ever expect anyone else to believe in you? And I think that's really, really empowering. And I think it's it's good to just realize that in this industry, you're not allowed to have an ego. It's a very small industry. Um, people don't realize the book industry. Everyone knows everyone. <laughs> and I think like the answer to success is always just being yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and that sounds probably very lame, <laughs> but but you can't you can't have an ego. And you have to just keep writing book after book after book and putting in your heart and soul into them, and knowing that maybe sometimes they're going to make good money off them you're gonna have good sales and maybe sometimes the book will tank most of my books that I thought would kill it and do crazy good have it and the ones that I'm like meh are the ones that always do better and so I think it's just it's just a matter of just like making it your hobby or job in a way and making sure that you're really um, staying not just relevant but you're staying true to yourself and again that sounds very cheesy but I've seen so many authors just like drop off because they decided that all of a sudden they were a huge deal or they decided that they um, all of a sudden deserved, you know, X, Y, Z because they hit a certain mark and then have like, you know, come crawling back, <laughs> you know, the humility like, whoopsies. 
Um, so I think that it's just there's so many different factors. It'd be really hard to be like, here's your formula and this is how you're going to be successful because it's different in like the industry, as you know, changes every few months. It does, like it's yeah. constantly changing. It does. So you have to stay relevant, but you also have to make sure that you're constantly researching, constantly bettering yourself and doing better with your marketing or switching or even able just to be like, okay, well, that didn't work now, but now everyone's doing this. So I'm going to try this now or I'm going to try to innovate this. Um, just like what you guys do in your company. So I think that that's the most important part. You just mentioned frequency and you have built up this reputation and everybody knows like that you're releasing at like such a high frequency, Mm -hmm. almost like one book every single month. You've been doing this over since over 12 years. That's mm-hmm. a long period of time. How do you write so fast? How do, how does that work? How, how do you how do you do this? I, if That's I amazing. Don't, if I don't write it, I, I will have a nervous breakdown. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's one of those things where I think people I think people look at it like that. They go, oh, she feels forced to write this or she has to or she has to like produce all of these books. But really, if I don't get the ideas out, I don't sleep at night. Like I literally will lay there until... <laughs> until I'm like, fine. And then I get up and I send like an email that doesn't make any sense to my assistant or to myself. And she'll be like, I think I know what you're saying in this email, but you misspelled everything in this sentence because it's three in the morning. <laughs> so I'm one of those people that if I can't write, like if I'm not able to write, I, I get worse anxiety. So like it's really my, my therapy for myself. So it's not even that I feel like I need to put tons of books out. I want to, and like that, that thirst is there still. Yeah, I see. And and why why is it important though that to to write so frequently? Because, so not just like mentally for me, but like yeah. for any author, like a lot of times you have like your front list and you have your back list. Mm-hmm. Your front list would be your your newer books, mm-hmm. so the ones that are coming out. And a lot of times you'll get new readers that are then like, oh wow, I really liked X Y Z, but oh my gosh, she has a hundred other books. I'm gonna go grab a couple of those backlist books or I'm going to do this. Like I have so many emails from people where they just randomly decided to read like my mafia series, but then they're like, there's a spinoff series. There's paranormal. Like I don't even like paranormal, but I like her voice. So maybe I'll try it. So I think that having the front list really pushes that backlist and you never know, like there's authors right now that I've seen go viral on book talk for books I wrote in like 2011 Wow! that all of a sudden their books are number one in the Amazon store all and they're like, sudden. yeah, they're like, I don't even know how this happened. And yeah. so you just never know, but your front list is always what's going to push your back list. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really cool. And speaking about, about your readers and the, that you're, you, you just mentioned like how the readers are feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, when we got in touch with you initially, we, uh, we learned that uh, you have this massive uh, 60,000 people uh, mailing list mm-hmm. and um, you have a phenomenal uh, open rate of your, your emails of like 45 or 50 percent mm-hmm. and industry standard is just 20 percent, right? Mm-hmm. And um, you have, this is like a testament to the, the community that, that you have built and this t- community is so engaged. So h- how did you build this super engaged community that you're able to get this kind of feedback from? Slowly, <laughs> I think. I think so often, um, and this is when I used to own a publishing house. Um, my husband and I had an indie house, and we would publish authors, and they just immediately always thought, you know, I put the book out there, and now it's going to sell millions of copies, or now it's going to do great. But right. you have to think of yourself as like a snowball. Like you, you mm-hmm. have to like slowly gain that traction and go down that little hill and like gain more and more and more and more. Mm-hmm. And what I did when I first started out is I didn't charge for my books, so I would go to signings. Uh-huh and either give them out for free or charge only $5. I actually just started charging like industry rate, like 15 bucks for paperback um, back in 2022. Up until then, I was like ready to sell them out of my car. You know what I mean? Like you have to be willing to, again, invest in yourself, but like give things for free Mm -hmm. for people to like take a chance on you. Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, that's one of the things that a lot of newer authors like hope take that to heart. Again, you're not a big deal. Like, it doesn't matter. Give your books away for free. Do what you can for free. My newsletter um, open rate, I truly think that that happened because I was doing um, free chapters in my newsletters. So I would give away, like, a chapter every week or every other week of, like, a brand new book. Uh Um, Yeah, or, like, a part of, like, you know, like, a book series that I knew was already, like, selling really well. Mm -hmm. And I would only release them, and and you'd have to open it up in order to read it, right? And then Uh we also do, um, every newsletter, we do, like, a um, giveaway. So, like, if you open it, you're automatically entered in to win a gift card and free merchandise. So people can, so they automatically want to open it, right? Because they're, like, free stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of those things that I just, that's kind of what I did. And then I think on the other end, I would finish the book, right, in my newsletter, 
and then I would re-release it in paperback and in ebook on Amazon, Kobo, Apple. Um, so like on both ends, you're not only getting a good open rate, but you're also making money on the back end of something that you've already written, if that makes sense. So I see, I yeah. see. And um, you're mentioning all these tricks and mm -hmm. ways and, and of doing things and like giveaways and like what to write in the email and the chapter to give away, et cetera. When you were starting out, um, I guess you didn't know all these tricks yet. And mm -hmm. Um, you had this, you said that this mindset of like you were believing in yourself and that you would make it at some point. And but how how did you learn about all these tips and tricks and how to do this, how to become successful? Like in specifically, for example, now with for the for the mailing list mm -hmm. um, or or all these other tips and tricks that you're mentioning. How did you learn this? How did you get here? I think that's part of being um, why it's so important to ingrain yourself in the author community, mm -hmm. meaning like on Facebook or if it's Facebook or if it's Instagram or if you're in like different author groups and networking. I believe when I decided to do my newsletter, like my uh, my book, I saw Penny Reed do something like that. And I was like, well, that's smart. <laughs> and so what I learned early on is really investing in other authors and finding mm -hmm. out what are they doing, what works. And I'm part of several different Facebook groups mm -hmm. and just different groups alone that we talk about like, okay, what's working for you? What's not working? What are you guys doing now? And for the most part- and You got to meet these all these authors through these Facebook groups yeah. or how, how did you get in touch? Just ran I mean, randomly. And I think the other thing is there's so many different signings and conferences that you can go to. And mm -hmm. so when I went to my first one, I was ready to have like, you know, pass out like on the elevator and you just have to start networking. And I always tell people when you are at those conferences, your entire job, yes, to be there for readers, even if you only have one of them there, but to also network with other authors. So I had to put on like the big boy pants and like go, go to the bar and order a drink and be like, hi, so-and-so, um, I'm Rachel, you don't know me and I'm really nervous and my palms are sweaty, but can I get your card or can I do this? So, I mean, really just networking, you know, being an author, like you're a startup, right? You're mm -hmm. your own. You have to like treat it like a business. And so when you're at those places and you're investing, you know, in yourself or doing a signing, you have to make sure that you're actually out out there just like hitting the pavement hard. And, and honestly, that's the best advice I could give. And it, and it sucks because I'm not... I feel like we talked about this too. Like I am a total introvert. Oh wow! People don't realize this. Like they always think at signings are like she has so much energy and she's like yes. bouncing around. And I'm like, no, no, no. Because then I go home and I crash. Right. So <laughs> I, but I, I feed off other, off other people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you go to these places or go to these signings, which um, we can probably link that later, maybe. But there's so many throughout the country, overseas, that you could go to as an indie author, as an early author. Um, and really just like use those signings as a way to network with those people because that's what's going to help you get further on in your career. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's amazing. That's an amazing ad ad advice. And you being an introvert, going out, doing whatever it takes to, mm -hmm. to succeed. Um, I know you had also like a big goal for uh, your uh, TV and, and, and movie projects and you were like, hey, I'm going to reach this. How are you doing that? Like, how are you setting your goals? And like, what are like the tips and tricks that you could you could share to uh, for other authors how to how to set goals for themselves and how to how to reach them? That's a whole nother like seven hour conversation, probably. <laughs> I just decided that I wanted to move into screenwriting and it's really hard because you have to use different software. You're not writing on Microsoft Word. You're writing in Final Draft. Mm -hmm. There's a different format that you have to do for everything. And that's really frustrating as an author because you're used to doing it one way. And all of a sudden, like, you have to do it differently. Just like I started doing graphic novels. And I'm like, oh, I have to do panels, not pages, panels. Like, what's a panel? Like, okay, Google. Yeah. I really use the power of search engines and then just asking people questions. I, I have been very lucky to have people in the industry that I've just met through the networking that are like, oh, I'm a producer or I do this or I do that. And I'm like, cool, we should talk soon. I mean, it really is just like meeting people. Um, I had told myself uh, post pandemic, I was like, I told myself that I wanted to be at the Oscars. Like I'm like, I'm gonna win an oh, Academy wow. Award and that is my next goal. And I know that that's very lofty um, but I'm going to do it. Wow. And so I think just sending, like setting new benchmarks for yourself. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I have written three pilots. I have three options for TV series and Amazing. Um, I'm a writer on two of them and we're pitching another one this next week. So I, and again, that's just all in networking, meeting people Amazing. and whatnot. So I just think that's really, that's really what it is. Like, it's not that I've done anything. I didn't go like hit the streets in LA and be like, please produce me. It's just like meeting people um, 
and just using that as a way to like facilitate those relationships and then just build on that. Yeah. So the Matchmakers uh, Playbook, mm -hmm. that was the, the first book that was turned into a movie. Mm -hmm. How did that all happen? How, how was it? Who, who, did, did you get a phone call? Did, did you reach out to somebody? How, how did all of that happen? So they con so Passion Flix is the person uh, the company that did the Matchmakers Playbook, right. and they um, are their own um, streaming service. Um, and also they put their stuff through Amazon Prime as well. And they actually just contacted my agent um, through Amazon and they were like, hey, this book looks like it'll do a really great rom-com. Can we, you know, contract it out? And we were like, okay. And my agent at the time was like, don't sign that contract. And I was like, no, I feel like this is a really good, this is, we should just try it because I don't really care. I don't even care if I get paid. Like, I just want my name out there and I'll build on that. Like, I would rather have marketing. I'd rather have like people pushing me and then it'll push the rest of my stuff. And so with Matchmakers, it was kind of that. I was like, well, even if the contract isn't like your favorite, um, we're still gonna sign it and we're still gonna see what happens. And so they contacted us and now they've done tons of movies. I know they're producing JR Awards, Black Dagger Brotherhood, which is like the best series ever. They're doing that this next year. They're just amazing. Like they did a really great job and I made really great friendships with the actors like to this day. So yeah, it, it really was just like a random contact. But a lot of times too, when I think that this is something that new authors need to know, you can get contacted tons of times by producers. That doesn't mean that it's gonna happen. I, at one point, had Reese Witherspoon's agent contact me for not just her book club, but to like make one of my books into a movie or TV series. And they wanted me to do like a one pager. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. Like, I don't know, I don't know what that is. Like a synopsis, like what's this? My agent's like, this is huge. And I'm like, how'd they even know that I had this deal coming out, like this announcement? We'll come to find out a lot of these, you know, like producers, they're watching your social media, right? So like they were watching and they saw my deal announcement and they were like, oh, that sounds interesting. She might like that. And they reached out to me. So you never know what people are watching or seeing on your social media. So it's really important, obviously, to just be aware of that because you never know who might contact you or who might randomly be like, P.S., we want to make this into a TV series or, you know, something more. I see. I see. So do you, do you think that that happened through your manifestation of like, <laughs> hey, I want to be on the Academy Awards and made, did that like change your behavior, how you were on social media, how you were putting yourself out there that attracted these people? No, I'm, I'm always the same on social media. So like I've always told myself, like you're Switzerland on social media. You're not allowed to have an opinion. <laughs> like you just have to be so careful. And so I always told myself, like I will always respond personally to every email and I will always just be my authentic, authentic self. I think being positive, I am a huge believer in what you speak, you believe. So if you're saying something out loud, your your brain, and this is actually like a scientific thing, like your brain actually believes it, mm -hmm. which is why it's so bad to be negative and have like negative thoughts and say them out loud because your body does react to that, right? So I try to have positive reinforcement in my life as much as possible. And I think with the whole like wanting, you know, wanting to be at the Academy Awards, wanting to do all these things, I just kept saying it over and over again. Maybe one day I'll get there. I'm hoping so. so. I know that there are a lot of authors now listening to this who are um, just starting off and they mm -hmm. have also this, these big dreams and they're probably also manifesting that, that they want to have their movie to be out there. And it's, it's super tough. Um, uh, there are only a handful of, uh, or dozens of, of uh, movies or TV series made every year uh, based, on, based on books, especially from indie authors. Mm -hmm. So what are the specific advice you would give to these authors? What should they be doing? I would definitely do my research. Um, I would download, if you wanna you know, make your book into a movie, I would download Final Draft, which is the software you would use to write an actual script. Producers, for the most part, really like to have the author involved as far as writing. If you already come to the table with that already done, then it's way easier for them to sell. Mm -hmm. So that's, and that's something I just learned like literally in the last year and a half. So um, knowing how to do that and then also knowing how to do like, like I said before, like a one pager, two pager, three pager, like know the industry standards for things. Because now whenever I have a new book release, I already have that done because we're always pitching for movie stuff. Like I just had one just the other day, but if I already have it ready to go, like a one pager, which is like a synopsis, like a longer synopsis you can pitch because the other thing is producers don't read, like they hate reading. So um, and a lot of times they have their team read something, but if you like pitch a book to someone, they're, unless your sales are incredible, they're gonna just like toss it in the trash, like they don't care. So having that one pager, having that pitch ready to go, or like even just a log line. Um, I know my agent now, she's like, I've sold, so she sold so many, um, series just off a log line, which is like three of the best lines you will ever write <laughs> based on your book 
that, you know, people see and they're like, ooh, that sounds good. So I did a K-pop book and the K-pop book, My Summer and Soul, got picked up before it even released. But I had to do one page for it. I had to do a log line. Um, and at the time, like, it, it, that was all new to me. And I think, too, on top of that, like, once you find a really good production team that you're working with or once, you know, that great, awesome thing happens, continue to work with them and to facil- facilitate those relationships. Because, like, right now I'm, I have a couple projects with, like, the same production company, but it's, we just love working together. So it's just, it's just been a really fun experience for all of us. And again, like, no one cares. Don't be a diva. Just, just write your book, do your job. And, um, and I think the universe gives back to you when you do that. Super cool. Great to hear. Amazing. You wrote your first couple of books Mm -hmm. and everything started to grow. You guys started doing some Facebook ads and you kept uh, publishing one book every every month almost. And you kept uh, doing that for a for a for a period of time. And that kept uh, kept like growing your audience and your sales and your community became bigger, etc. But along this journey, like when was it that you actually realize you're not now not just an author, but actually you're also building a business? And how did how did all of that happen? I know that you have an amazing team. How did all of that get started? Um, when I had to pay taxes, <laughs> <laughs> which sounds so dumb <laughs> when I say it out loud, but you get me, you know what I mean? And you're like, oh I no, <laughs> yeah. You're like, I'm self-employed. What do I do? And so then I was like, I apparently need a lawyer and I apparently need to have a financial advisor and I need to have like all these different things and an accountant because I don't know how to do this. And that's when I kind of realized like, oh, when you're self-employed, you have to save that percentage, right? The more successful you get, the more you have to pay. So I don't want to have to pay this much. And I also need to figure out how to like make this into a brand um, because you see a lot of like old indie authors, like their their branding went from like a certain font on their, you know, their paperbacks that were like selling super well to like something different. Mm-hmm. Um, so we decided early on that like, okay, if my font is XYZ, then it needs to be that on every cover, on everything, unless it's like a different genre. And since I write in different genres, it became like this whole this whole thing. Oh, wow. Um, So that's really early on, like quite honestly, probably in 2013 is when I was like, oh, man, like we have to figure this out because this is super stressful. And I am and I and I get overwhelmed with like the admin stuff. Um, I always tell other authors, like if I could just be the talent and just write the book, that'd be amazing. But you have if you looked at my screen time on my phone, you'd be horrified of how long I spend on just social media alone, like answering people. And then on top of that, like making posts and then. I get maybe this tiny, like, small amount of time to actually write the book, you know, during a day. Um, A lot of our stuff, like, it would be so nice to not have to market and not do that, but you have to be seen. So um, and it, I feel like it gets worse and worse, like, as more as we're, like, subjected to so much social media and just, like, I think it used to be you get, like, 15 seconds to, like, catch someone and they have to see it five to seven times. I believe now it's four seconds um, because of TikTok and because of Reels and stuff like that. Like, people's attention span are just, it's gone. Like, it's gone. Even my two-year-old, like, he'll, like, look at something and just scroll, scroll. And I'm like, you didn't even, <laughs> like, they didn't even blink. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. But I mean, that's just how we are now. You know, Snapchat, like it doesn't, it doesn't make it easy on authors. And so you have to figure out a way to just kind of go with what's going on in the industry. And that's kind of how, um, how I've built my business is going, okay, well, that's not working anymore. If you're KU and you're targeting those people, then yeah, maybe an Amazon ad, maybe Facebook ads, but you'd have to just like decide like based on what you're writing, based on when you're releasing, like there's just so much involved in that that you have to look into, which is I know very stressful for authors, but it definitely makes it to where you're like, okay, I'm a business now. Like I'm not just an author. Our own CEOs, we're all hustling. We all have teams. I have a team of like six people. Wow. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's 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 intense. And this uh, team of six people, like, mm-hmm. did you hire them from the get-go, from the beginning? When? How, how did all of that happen? That same networking, just meeting networking. people and people um, being like, hey, uh, I can help you with this or I can start your fan group. I just slowly started getting people like trickling in or people even to now still will like email me and be like, hey, do you have any any like contract work available? Like I'm, I'm an editor or um, I can do publicity or I can do tours. I can do this. And so mm-hmm. there's mm-hmm. a big industry of people that can come in and help you. It's just mm-hmm. a matter of like paying them obviously (laughs) but also just you know having like that team by your side so like my assistant's been with me over a decade and we literally met because she was a reader that's it that's and she used to be a ceo and so and she works with other authors too and like runs her own blog and is extremely successful in her own right and that's kind of how it happened with like my editors like my one editor i've had for probably close to a decade too okay and she's on my team and she's 
used to do my my books at another indie house. And then when I went and started doing self-publishing and like when I submit stuff to my publishers now, she goes through everything. So, and I've been with her for forever. Same with like graphic artists. Like, I mean, just everything. It just, and it's kind of one of those things too, like now that I'm established, I can post in my group and be like, I need this, this, and this. And so it's pretty awesome that I can go in. And then now too, if I haven't like a new author that, you know, it's brand new and they're like, hey, um, so like the other day they were like, I wrote a K-pop book, but I don't know who to, pub- to publish it under. And I don't know who to use for a sensitivity reader because you have to, if you're, if you're a white girl writing a, a Korean American, like you need to have sensitivity readers. Like it's just it. And I have always written, like written really diverse characters. And so like, I always have a team depending on like what genre it is. What is a sensitivity reader? Okay. So it'd be like, if you are writing a different race, um, or even mixed race, like as a white person Mm -hmm. you need to have sensitivity readers that come in and they read it and they say like this is okay this is not okay to say recently it's been like really huge that like if you're writing any sort of diverse book you have to have sensitivity readers like and i know it sounds crazy but you want to be so um sensitive to uh, those different cultures right Mm -hmm. um it's important for me to use my platform as a way to allow that and allow like that diversity um so like with my k-pop book my summer and soul the writer is, I was like, I want a female writer to do like the script and I want her to be Korean American. Like, I don't need to write it. So I'm actually not writing the script at all. She did everything because I'm like, that's not my space. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to use my platform to offer that space up to someone else so that Mm -hmm. they have the opportunity to do this. And so that's kind of how we did it that way too. And I feel like, I feel like I accomplished something because I'm like, every publisher was like, don't write this. And then it did so well. And on top of that, I was like, no, I'm going to use my space to give someone else space that needs that space and and make sure that their voices are heard. You know what I mean? Yeah. And these sensitivity readers, do they only help you to not say the wrong things or do they also help you fine tune your narrative and improve your story for a specific audience? It's both. It both. definitely is both. Yeah. So a lot of times, I mean, I do really intense research. Like, for example, like when I do my mafia books, like I literally have like I call it the mafia bible <laughs> it's like this big um and I interview there's a mafia bible yeah there is there's... I can I'll send it to you <laughs> um so I get I'm like really triggered when I see people write mafia and like they don't do it right I'm like come on like I swear my eye twitches I'm like you didn't do it right <laughs> um because like there's like a way that you do things and so I w- like went to the mafia museum in Vegas I have a mafia bible I interviewed uh actual mafia oh my God. people that went like their kids yeah so like so everything that i do is like very 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 authentic and then like i will then send an email to <laughs> i'm not gonna say who it is i will send an email <laughs> to these people, these people that are in the mafia and be like hey does this check out and they're like totally and i'm like cool thanks like i mean you have to like be on point on that and i think too like romance gets such a bad rap for being cheesy or like all these things are like, oh, you write romance books. But like, I want mine to be intelligent and I want them to like actually tell a story, not just like, I think people look at it and they're like, oh, it's just about sex. And I'm like, no, it's not. Like there has to be like a driving factor in everything that you write. And so, um, yeah, so sensitivity readers help with all of that. And also it's just good just to be careful, I think, especially in in the industry that we're in, but also like making sure that you're not just educating people, but you're educating yourself as well. I see. I see. Got it. So sensitivity readers were people that, that you hired within your business while mm-hmm. building this. Uh, you mentioned uh, you you hired uh, your assistant 10 years ago. That was like one or two years in after you got started. Um, when did you bring in the, the rest of the team? Um, when, when, when was that? Was it also very early on? When did you kind of realize that you need more help, that you can't do everything on your own? Um, that's usually when my assistant, Jill, I call her Scary Jill, tells me <laughs> she's the best, but she'll be like, hey, you can't do all of this right now. And so my assistant, like, to be fair, she does so much for me and she'll contact people or she'll tell me like what we need to do. We have weekly meetings where we catch up and she says, OK, well, this is falling behind or you can take the day off today, but you have to finish this book tomorrow. So she's actually your boss. Basically, yeah, I get <laughs> bossed around. And And the other thing is like my husband is very good at being like directing me and managing me in a way that needs to happen like he knows like what books I have to get done and when I'm traveling what I'm doing yes but yeah so my husband does a really good job of like keeping 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 it together yeah so he's also on the core team yes keeping, definitely keeping you happy mm-hmm. you just mentioned this uh a pressure of being always being on and always mm-hmm. performing just like how you went on on, on stage at book bonanza and mm-hmm. um uh this 
it is it is quite a lot of stress that a lot of authors are dealing with. You you started 12 years ago. You've been publishing one book every single month. Yeah. I've been constantly performing, constantly on. I think it was John Green who was very public about like this uh, pressure that authors go through. Yeah. Um, uh, trying to kind of maintain their their level of success. And for you, it's been already 12 years. There are probably only a handful of authors that started uh, when you started in your mm-hmm. cohort 12 years ago and are still going on strong. How has it been from from uh, your point of view? How, how did you survive these 12 years? How are you enduring? How are you pushing through? Um, how has it been from your perspective? You're very correct in all that. Like, there's a lot of authors that, like, you just don't even hear from anymore. There was a lot of publishers that were giving indie authors huge book deals. And I think that is what actually kind of killed a lot of those authors' careers because Mm -hmm. you have to earn out, right? You have to earn out those book deals. You have to make sure that your book sells. Mm -hmm. And they were just grabbing, like, let's, like, Pokemon cards. They're just collecting, you like, Pokemon, and they're trying to give all this money out and then just thinking like, oh, they're an indie author, they're gonna sell really well, and then it didn't happen. And so then people stopped getting traditional book deals. And I think now what I'm seeing more is it's kind of swinging back towards that whole indie thing. So back then everyone was like, okay, I've only made it if I'm in Target, I've only made it if I'm in Costco, whatever. Um, So they were taking all these book deals, not realizing that you actually typically make more money if you're an indie author. Um, So now it's kind of swung back to more indie authors, more hybrid. Um, for me, that's what I, I feel like a good secret I could tell, which I always tell people, so it's really not a secret, but is to have your hand in both pots, right? So like I do indie stuff um, a couple times a year, but I always take one to two book deals a year. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a lot of, um, there's wisdom in that mm-hmm. because with indie books, you never know if they're going to do good. You never mm-hmm. know, like, is this book going to tank? Is it going to do great? Like, I'm hoping it's going to do great. But depending on even like the economy, depending on, I mean, look at COVID, like if you didn't have your book on pre-order for that, you weren't making anything, like people were just going crazy. Um, so I think having traditional book deals along with indie book deals is is a very, very intelligent thing to do because then you know exactly what your income is gonna be, yeah. no matter what. Every book that you write can tank, but you know that with this traditional book, you're making this much money and you can put food on the table and you can continue to like do what you want to do. Right, um, right. So, I so think, n- not yeah. only the, um, <clears throat> that, that you, you were diversified uh, indie and non-indie, uh, traditionally published, mm-hmm. but also I think from a very early on, you decided that you don't want to be just purely everything on, on KU. You've been like one of the first authors who kind of realized that and uh, went, went this path. Like, h- how, did, how did you make that decision? Um, having people <laughs> around me that were like, maybe we should try this. And honestly, you know, I, I do publish with Amazon. So I publish um, under Skyscape and Montlake. Um, so what I noticed being one of their authors is when they did KU, I lost my entire Apple reading, readership. Like usually when I would release um, wide, release an Apple wide, guys, if you're listening, that's, you know, when you're releasing like across every every channel, I would be in the top five to 10 every time. The minute I started publishing with just KU alone and publishing with Amazon, I lost my entire readership on Apple Books and Barnes & Noble. Same with Barnes & Noble. Like, I would be in the top, like, two or three. And that was, like, early on, not even when I had really a huge audience. It killed me. Like, it was, like, literally shooting myself in the foot. Um, and at the time, KU was doing so good that I didn't really, like, care that much. But now it's kind of, again, swung back. And so I think authors now are realizing um, – that going wide there's I mean dropping your net into as many ponds as you can is never a bad idea Mm -hmm. but I had to do a talk on apps like reading apps and I talked about you guys and I talked about a couple of the other ones that I work with and at the time um I would get emails from like different countries and they would say hey we really want to put your backlist or your these books on our app is that okay like let's talk about contracts let's do this and I was always like sure why not (laughs) like sounds sounds good to me because like why not take a chance because if it's not exclusive I don't care. And it's a book that's been around for like, you know, 10 years. Like I just signed another contract with China and I'm like, you can take that book. Like it's been around for 13 years. Like it's not, it's making a dollar a day, like if that. So please take it off my hands. I don't care at all. And at the time I was in this author group and they were all like, oh yeah, so-and-so emailed me and said this. And they didn't even have like the translation wasn't even correct as far as like what they said in the email. And I'm like, they're not American. Like, of course it's not going to be correct. I'm like, just take a chance. Like, it's totally like not a big deal. Take a chance on them. And honestly, at that time, I took a chance and I want to say like six different apps and they've all paid out amazing. 
you guys have been the number one, like best one to work with. Ink it, everyone. Um, no, literally, like so great. But had I not responded to like any of those emails, like I would have never been here talking to you right now. So like I always encourage authors just to take a chance. Legitimately, these countries that's people don't understand that like in different countries, they don't buy off Amazon. And you and I have talked about this before. Like that's not how they consume information. Like that's they correct. They, they use reading apps and that's how people just don't understand that they consume different information in like different ways. And my husband has always been like a huge advocate about like my foreign sales. He's like, who cares if you, you know, hit New York Times? He's like, over there in India, if you sold your book and you had, he's like, do you know how many people live there? He's like, you know, like in the same South Korea, like China. He's like, no, 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 no. That's where your money is at. That's where your gold mines are at. And so I've really been trying to diversify that way. Fully agree with you. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you mentioned like how you did all these strategies um, to go wide, to mm-hmm. um, uh, to have your book not only available on Amazon, but also on, on Apple and Barnes and & Noble and be available everywhere. You just mentioned that um, uh, you went to Book Bonanza to do signings. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, t- let's talk a little bit about the, the, the kind of like the level of, of stress that comes with um, be, being an author, being a successful author, being always, always on. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I know that there are a lot of authors who have been doing it for a lot shorter period of time than, than you have been, been uh, doing this. And they're already feeling like super stressed out. Mm-hmm. And, um, and a lot of authors publicly talking about this, this level of, of, of stress. What is, what is your secret of like um, enduring and, and uh, being able to do this for such a long period of time? What, is, what are the things that, that you learned? I think for me, it's learning how to say no. So I used to, every, I was so honored to get asked to all these signings. I was just like, okay, 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 I would say yes. And spend all, because you know, authors pay to be at a signing, right? Like we pay for our own table, you pay for your own um, hotel. Um, I think this whole like I think uh, that's something that a lot of authors don't realize. Right. When, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm paying mm-hmm. to be there, and I'm losing money by being there. That's crazy. So yeah, so like even if I sell say like 300 books, I'm still losing money, right? So I'm there not for me. I'm there for the readers, and I'm there to network, right? Like a good example is like if you want to buy your own, like you can invite if you have the you know the opportunity to get invited to a mm-hmm. signing, right? You say yes. You spend 400 to 600 dollars for the table, okay? And that's just your table fee that you have to pay to be there after you get the honor of being invited. And then you have to think about your food, your hotel. Like, I think Book Bonanza cost me and my husband a reverse like six grand just to attend. Wow. wow. Yeah. And and that and that's including me making money off my books. And when you're there, you're there with all your readers. So there is no timeout, right? So you are literally in the hotel with readers. You're in the elevator with readers. You're eating dinner with readers, which is really cool, but it, it can cause burnout very fast. So my biggest thing was saying, not saying yes to every single signing and learning like, yes, it's great to get asked. But like this year, like I took I took a year off. Like I decided that I wasn't going to do so many anymore because I was traveling so much. Um, and while you do get fed in a way where like your cup is full when you see your readers and you get to talk to other authors and you get to really like invest in other people. When you come home, you really do crash. But there is no time out. There is no vacation. Like I haven't taken a vacation in probably eight years. Wow. Um, because my, I always tell myself my signings are my vacation, but really that's not a vacation. Mm-hmm. So um, I think as far as burnout and stuff, I don't really think there's a secret other than just saying, learning how to say no. And I have had a couple health scares. Um, I think we talked about that too. Like I had a seizure um, back in 2021 um, from stress. Like it literally was just wow. from stress. And I know a couple of other authors that like uh-huh. had 911 called on them because they just passed out, just passed out again from stress um, or had heart attacks. <laughs> so like it is a very real thing, like the burnout. Um, John Green is very accurate on this. But I think the biggest thing is like knowing what your boundaries are. And I'm a total yes person, people pleaser. Like I want everyone to be happy. I want everyone just to hold hands and like sing Kumbaya. But like we can't, that's not the world that we live in. And so I've really learned how to just be like, no, I can't, I cannot do that today. Yes. And I think it's important to have those boundaries. And Having know, that level of reflection, knowing yeah, yourself. And know what they are. Like, and if that means that when you wake up in the morning, like I know authors that they will like literally their first 15 minutes that they get up, they get their coffee and they write their goals for the day. And then they write like what they're willing to do that day and what, what they're, you know, and not like lofty goals, just like an actual goal, what they're going to do. They meditate. Um, which I do as well. And then they're like, okay, if I get this done, good. And I think you have to take, my sister has five kids. And so she was always telling me like, Rachel, did you, 
did you wake up today? And I'm like, yes. And she's like, good job. And she's like, did you brush your hair? And I'm like, nope, but it's in a ponytail. She's like, perfect. Like, I mean, it's just like those small victories. Like you have to honestly not have, you can have lofty goals, but you have to have like the small goals too. So like if I wake up and for whatever reason I don't have lipstick on, like it's okay, but guess what? I made breakfast for everyone, so it's fine. So just like taking those small goals and making them like a big achievement is really powerful, especially when you work from home. You just have to take those those small small goals and, and I don't know, pat yourself on the back for at least like making it through. Yes, yeah. yeah. I think what, what you just mentioned is on the one hand, uh, going all in and being an introvert, going to networking events and like mm-hmm. going all in and trying to do whatever it takes. Um, and I guess that's that's also very stressful mm-hmm. for you as an as an introvert going to all these events and with hundreds of people wanting to speak with you, getting doing signings, networking with the with the with the authors, you knowing that you have a very limited amount of time because you have spent so much money on this entire trip, mm-hmm. you make to need to make the best out of it. But the on, on the other hand, also being reflected enough and knowing your personal limits and being able to say no. And um, I think that's 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 uh, super cool to um, see that this is this is your your method and this is mm-hmm. the method of how to be successful for such a long period of time of point, knowing both sides that you need to go all in, but then you also need to stop at some point. Mm-hmm. And, and making sure that you're present when you're there. Like um, that's the other thing I would say, like if if I have committed to a signing and I'm there for two days, like I do not get to make ex- excuses for myself for my own behavior like i am there and i am present and i am 100 if i don't even sleep the entire time but i'm there with readers investing in them like there was a reader that in my last one she just walks up to me and is like my cancer's back and i'm like oh my gosh and like dropped everything <laughs> was like let me pray with you like are you okay and um same like at, at some of those signings people are like passing out in line in the line because it's like so hot and there's thousands of people there right but like making sure that you're there and you realize and you remind yourself like this is a privilege. This is a privilege to be here and to be with these readers and this they're investing their money to be there too. So like you, do, you don't get to complain. You don't get to have a bad day. And I think yes, saying no to where you're not overstretching yourself when it comes to like that, you know, your signing year or whatever you're doing, but also making sure that when you are there, you are very present and you have a happy heart. And good, as I tell my kids, a happy heart and a good attitude. And because like those readers are there too and you never know what people are going through. Um, and so just making sure you're reinvesting in them, I think is super powerful as well. That's very cool. Yeah. I love having this this chat with you where uh, it's it's about time for us. Um, so I wanted to ask you uh, about this chat that we just had, if mm-hmm. uh, people should take one one takeaway from from this chat, um, one thing that uh, was the the main reason, main source of 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 your success. What is it? Resilience. <laughs> resilience. <laughs> never giving up. Yeah, resilience, never giving up. And just quite honestly, don't become a writer because you think you're going to make money. Become a writer because it's what you love to do. Um, we're so privileged to be writers. That, like for me, especially, I love what I do. Like I literally look forward to waking up in the morning and writing and creating stories. So I think sometimes you can get so caught up in all the other stuff like the drama and the admin stuff and the marketing and Facebook ads and what am I doing and my sales and all these different things or I have to post another TikTok today but really just like investing in yourself and loving what you do and reminding yourself that like not a lot of people get to do what they love and and that's key that's huge and I think that's why I've stayed around so long because I actually genuinely love what I do um so don't get into it because you think all these things are going to happen or I'm going to be famous or I'm going to be TikTok famous. Like that's not, that's definitely not why I do what I do. It's a, it's a marathon, not, not a sprint. sprint. <laughs> that's exactly. And if you love running marathons, it's uh, <laughs> going to be easier. Rachel, thank you so much mm-hmm. for being with us today. It was a real pleasure to to talk to you and understand the, the reasons of your success, how you made it so far and looking forward to watch all your movies and TV series coming out soon. Um, so very much looking forward to that and uh, hopefully see you soon here again with us. Yeah, I, please invite me back. It's been really fun. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.